it's a, it's a question that's very hard to answer in a few words. It took me many years of research, and I tried to, to um, when I did the summation of those conclusions, I tried to write it as carefully as I could to be as accurate as I could, and that's a long, long list. Um, so, but to try to, to try to encapsulate that, um, you know, my, my research showed that, you know, most of the people who went to the bar were probably like average gay people. You know, except it was a young crowd. It'd be kind of like, you know, probably most any gay bar in the late 60s, early 70s. You know, it would have been mainly white, mainly male, mainly young. Uh, the, and that's more so in the, the first room. And at the bar, you would have had what would have been older people, meaning people in their 30s, you know. Who you wanted had, the younger people? <laughs> and, you know, maybe a few in their 40s. And you, uh, you had all different types in there. Uh, in the second room, it was more, you had more street people, and you had uh, more the uh, people who were black and Latino would tend to go in the second room more. But the, but the thing is, although they were smaller in number, uh, it was the street element and the, the elements kind of far gave the, the place more of its flavor. So more of the flavor came from them, although they were numerically a smaller group. Um, generally, transgender people were not allowed in. That would be exceptional, and not many of them went. Not many lesbians went. I think on the, the night of the, the, the ride began, you had more transgender people in there than was normal, and you probably had more lesbians than normal, and, I mean, an average population. Um, and then I think, you know, uh, I found uh, John O'Brien very useful to me in pointing out there was kind of a hierarchy of resistance. You know, there were most people uh, did stand around passively in the beginning, and often many times after the first night. Uh, in other words, they would be blocking traffic, blocking the sidewalks. You know, some people would be, you know, um, shouting, but people would actually take on the police. That was a smaller number. So I, you know, I, I wrote my book to reflect the evidence I collected, which showed the initial resistance inside mainly came uh, disproportionately from transvestites. Uh, a lesbian played, as we were mentioning earlier, played a key role in the resistance outside by fighting with the police in public and being brutalized by the police. And then we know uh, that several, a couple of the people outside also <coughs> who uh, resisted first were transgender people. Uh, Marsha Johnson, Randy, uh, Randy's friend, Randy's wearing a button with a picture of Marsha, was one of those. Another one we can name by name is Zazunova. The third person we can name is Jackie Romano. However, <coughs> on the outside, where most of the resistance came from in terms of numbers was the street youth, you know, who were, uh, you know, mostly white and mostly not transgender. So it's, it's a complicated mix. It's, it's not something one can say in a sentence or two and be accurate. It's, it's really, and it's much more involved than what I'm giving you here. And, and for those of us who were there, um, even we disagree with each other. We all have our own images. Um, and so that's why I said earlier it's important that we record history. And for those of us who have it, um, you two um, particularly, please do your memoirs. It's important. It's important for all of us. Um, we need to record this. My favorite line when someone asked me, well, so-and-so said they were there. And uh, the line that I use, and feel free to use it, is um, it was a riot. It was a revolution. Nobody was taking the role. It wasn't a roll call. <laughs> and it, it, it's the most ridiculous thing. Um, and everybody tries to get everything exactly alike. Again, it wasn't scripted. It wasn't a movie. Oh, someone did make a movie of it, didn't they? <laughs> a couple of people. <laughs> well, I'd like to add, too, to what you were saying, that, you know, I, I think the, the, the point isn't to try to, you know, take credit one group, you know, that everybody fought, you know, and everybody contributed. That's why, you know, I like John O'Brien's point. You know, those... But it's hard. I mean, you, people put me in a position of, I love this, you know, trans da 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 and then am I supposed to say, well, I'm a white guy? <laughs> you know, it just, you don't want to say that. At least I don't want to say that. Um, you might try to. Yeah. Well, I just think that everyone has to remember that it was a Saturday night. It was June. There were people on the street. Um, and all this ownership of who was there and who was not there is really irrelevant. Um, the only 
three police, one to St. Vincent's Hospital, because that's what police do, because one got bit by a lesbian who was well known within the community. She's not the one that I would attribute to starting it. But it's, it, there's too much ownership that's going on. And what happened was spontaneous then. No leaders, no planned organization, and I think David, you and I would agree, would agree on this. Um, and and the, the, the following nights is very different. But that first night, it's, uh, it makes me very sad that people are fighting with each other. Everybody was there, you know? Um, the, the, you call them trans, there were young runaway drag kids who were in the park in Christopher Street Park. They weren't allowed in the stand. Yes, they came over. And you're absolutely correct, the people that had something at risk, their livelihood, their marriage, their children, whatever, split. The rest of us just happened to be there. Yeah. And, and another point is, um, there was another, we sometimes don't even look at the, own, the classism in our own community, which um, this book really got me to, was an eye-opener for me. Um, I honestly believe one of the reasons GLF is not recognized the way it should be is, because those people who discovered gay radicalism after AIDS didn't have anything to do with us because they were the upper echelon of the gay community. But the upper echelon of the gay community in those days wasn't in Stonewall. They were in Julius's around the corner. That's generally true. Yes, yes. Just want to throw that out. I, I, I find it very upsetting that today uh, you can turn on the news and see homosexuals being thrown off the tops of buildings. And actually, we, we homosexual LGBT people, are one of the real cutting edges in the culture war that's engulfing the entire world right now. And yet, I find it very disturbing that there isn't more outrage, more interest on the part of the, gay, of the LGBT community in America when all these horrible things are happening overseas, like India recriminalized homosexuality and all the slaughter of gay people in the Mideast, I can say some groups like Rusa, which is a Russian group I marked with every gay pride, they actively help people come. I met a young man that was overstaying his visa, and now he has a green card and he's going to school in Iowa. This is what we should be doing in this country, are bringing in the best and brightest of our own people from abroad and saving them from slaughter. And yet I find there's no interest or interest in that issue, no matter how many times I, I wonder if you have any ideas about that. About a month ago, I spoke at the Harvard Coop. Yes, I spoke at the Harvard Coop, you're into that. Um, and it was a small crowd, and in the very last row, there was a black guy. And he was very quiet during most of the uh, session. Uh, then, at the end, he got up, and he had, his question was basically similar to yours. It was, well, you've talked about the United States. What about the rest of the world? And I said, well, Western Europe is pretty good. Uh, Eastern Europe, we have some problems, blah, blah, blah. Um, Africa, for the most part, is a disaster, and in the Middle East, it's a disaster. And I went into a little detail, whatever. But the most important part was, after... Uh, the session when I was signing books, he came up to me again and he said, I already bought your book. I bought it about a month ago, um, but it's really inspired me. And he says, I'm going to take it back with me. And I said, where are you taking it back uh, with you? Um, Uganda. And for those of you who don't know, Uganda, oh, he, the other part was, is that he studied um, uh, civil, not civil rights, I'm sorry, uh, human rights law at Harvard, which has one of the best human rights law departments in the world. Um, and he wants to fight for gay rights back in Uganda. So, in some sense, we can inspire and work with others in the world. Um, something that hasn't been recorded very well is that, in a sense, while Western Europe is light years ahead of us in many respects right now, when Gay Liberation Front started, it was way behind. And the first organization to be copied worldwide was Gay Liberation Front. There became Gay Liberation Fronts all over the world uh, trying to copy what we did here. Um, maybe we got to get to the point where we're leading again. Uh, at the moment, the way that that could be done would be through this presidential election. We should make every candidate for president, primarily when it gets down to Democrat and Republican, uh, agree uh, that they will accept refugees from all of those countries that kill or harm LGBT people. 
That's what we can do. I, I agree with you, Randy. I mean, uh, I've always been interested in the international issue. When I lived in Wisconsin, uh, one reason I always bought, um, remember there was a, a magazine that came out of Milwaukee and it was called GP Union? Yes. People's Union? Yeah. And they, had, they always have a whole page that would be dedicated to what was going around the world. And that was one reason I always read that magazine, so I had some idea of what was happening outside the United States. Yeah, I think we can do a lot more of that. Uh, and the incident you're talking about was ISIS was throwing gay people off of buildings. They've also beheaded them, um, and there's also been strict. There are strict laws in Saudi Arabia. Some of the other Gulf states are beginning to try to curb back on their anti-gay laws, but they are very strict. Um, Uganda is horrendous. Uh, there, they wanted to pass the Kill the Gays bill, um, which the Obama administration literally stopped. Christian missionaries from the United States. Correct. And, and in Iran, you are, have to be a transsexual. If you're a homosexual, you're immediately forced into sex reassignment surgery if you yeah. want to stay in Iran. Yeah. It's sort of like what we did in the United States to gay people. We lobotomized them. Well, I gave a shout out to, you know, the long forgotten by most people gay people's union, um, but I also want to say a tip of the hat to Rex Walkner who as a journalist has done a lot to uh, bring uh, attention to what's happening in other countries, and to Doug Ireland, who died, I think, this past year. Oh, he did a lot to cover he was one of what was happening. Other. We, yeah. we owe a lot to our journalists who really do you know, focus on what's happening in other parts of the world.